imagine if you went to Disney World and they gave you no map, there was no people working in the park, and they were just like, best of luck. That's how most sellers run calls. They're like, yeah. hey, here's this big park. I'm going to show you all the – here are all the rides, uh, and just tell me what you think. That's how most people run sales calls. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to B2B EQ. Today's guest is a sales pro and a media mastermind. I'm honored to have him on the show. Four-time LinkedIn top sales voice, a decade of content experience, but not just a content creator, 100% a seller at heart. He has worked, trained, done the job himself, and works hand-in-hand -hand with creators to help drive better connections with their audience and make authentic brands come to life. Founder and CEO of Ascension Media Productions, Morgan J. Ingram. Morgan, great to have you on, sir. Awesome. Uh, pleasure to be on. Excited for this conversation. Oh, I, I have been taking so many notes. We we got together back in, I think it was Chicago we caught up. And April. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yep. And uh, we've been going from there. So to me, as a marketer, before we jump into the soft skills and kind of the core of this podcast, as a marketer, content has always been king, right? But context is queen, I always say. And it's it's what drives that content to make sense. Sales has become so much of a channel at which brands communicate and people communicate through, especially in B2B. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing in content, why you see this being so important to B2B sales, kind of where you're taking this today. So when you think about content in the B2B realm, typically, uh, I, I don't even start this joke, but I've seen it a couple of times. It's, it's like boring to boring. Uh, most people will, like, you know, so say that. And because the content is very sales, very traditional. And when you look at where the world is going, you have to be non-traditional and be uh, edutainment, value, whatever you want to call it. You need to be doing more of that and being more unique in the way you, in the way you go about it. So the way that I've really been looking at content is, how do you create it in a way that people subscribe to you? How do you make it consistent? How do you make it so people will dive into what you're saying on a consistent basis and, and really attract to what you're wanting to say? And really what that comes down to is having a strong narrative. Uh, I say this a lot that if you have a strong narrative with your brand and also your content narrative, you're going to have more people interested in what you have to say because if you have a strong content narrative, people are going to really gravitate and be like, that really lands with me. Right. And you want them to say that and you want them to feel that, because if you think about the market right now, a lot of the tools are very similar. So the more you can get that narrative going and that piece going, the better it will be. I, I'm spot on with that, but I'm hearing a lot of sellers on this this podcast that are listening going, OK, that's marketing's job, right? Like <laughs> give me a good narrative. That's why I joined the company that's ready to go. Like I, I need marketing to serve that up. How does that fall today on the seller and how can a seller look at that? In, in kind of their domain, their locus of control? So it's still, it's still within the seller's control because you can control the narrative and the vision you're selling on these calls, right? You have just have to contextualize it to make sense. If you think about anything, let Apple, let's think about Apple. So Apple has the, I think the largest, I think they do have the largest market cap in the world. I think they have the highest cash on, cash on hand deposit as in terms of a company. And they're one of the old, well, there are other companies that are going, but their their stock that continuously goes up, right? It doesn't really ever really go down, right? Yep. So I'm saying all these things because Apple, if you think about it, is not really that earth shattering at its simple core, right? It literally is a phone, a computer, <laughs> right? Some chargers, an iPad, like you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, if you think about it, it's not really anything crazy, right? Because there were phones before, there were computers before. What what are they doing? They're they're selling you a vision, right? They're selling you a of what is to come and what they are. And you feel like, well, this brand is something I will buy anything from this brand, right? To the point where like, you know, I have an Apple card, right? That have an Apple credit card, right? Apple yeah. is banking, right? They're getting into health. Like you just gotta really pay attention. So everything that Apple does, they could literally drop, the Apple could drop a shoe and people would probably buy the shoe, right? 
that's just like where they're at. And so the thing is, is that when you think of this as a seller, even if you feel like, wow, we don't, marketing's not giving us a good narrative. You, you pick the company, you're there, unless you want to leave, but you're there. So understand what the narrative is and then sell to that narrative in your own sense. And then go look at some customer stories. And then you start using that as your selling piece as well. I like that. I, I think making the narrative contextual, because I think that's the gap and that's the, the, to me, that's the, the power of the sales channel, right? Like I, as a marketer can go one to many, I can put a video out there for a thousand people to see, but I don't get to have that one-to-one -one conversation mm -hmm. with that person that talks about their business needs, their business wants, like what are their personal goals in that organization? That's the intimate kind of contextual piece that a seller gets that, that as a marketer we crave, but there's no way to scale that in the marketing side. No. That, no. That's where that sales channel is so strong. Exactly. And because you can, again, like you said, the context, you can add that context to each conversation, but you have to be good at the narrative selling along with the product selling. Because again, the, the product nowadays is just not going to beat out another product. You have to really sh sell that narrative, right? And if you think about it, the greatest salespeople of all time are not people that are in sales. They are the founders that have the vision and sell that thing, right? If you think about Steve Jobs, who people is the greatest, well, he also is the greatest salesperson, right? Like he would be doing that presentation pitch and people are like, whoa, this is incredible. So it's what it's, that's how you need to think about it is how do I sell the narrative? How do I sell the vision? So people latch on. And, and we've got a webinar coming up that you're working on with uh, one of our sellers. And I have to shoot out a little plug to this. It's coming up in July 18th. And I think there's going to be a ton of value in terms of, of the content that you're talking about. But one of the main trends, and it goes back to content, right? Because we use content to keep people engaged, to, to share a message. But we know if, if I'm not paying attention, if I'm doing the iPhone prayer right, right here, mm. there is no video, there's no slide, there's no content that's going to all of a sudden just seep into my brain and, and change my mind. Like I've got to be engaged in what you're telling me. So right. how do we in this video environment keep buyers engaged? So when you think in just, in just video, you're saying? Yeah. Well, like through a video meeting, because I think it's a lot harder to keep them engaged over a video call, like this type of a format compared to, I'm sitting in the room with you. Right. Like I know you're looking at your phone. You're right there in front of me. I yeah. can't see what's on a screen. I can't see what's going on behind you. It's a way different environment when you're on video. It is. I think the cliche saying of like, in order to be um, interesting, you need to be interested. Like, you know, everyone has probably heard that before. I think it, the same applies to the video piece. Now, obviously it is a lot harder to connect with someone on video than it is in person. I'm not going to completely discredit that. That's absolutely important. But what you also need to pay attention to as well and what's going to be critical throughout this entire thing is what are some things that you can pick up immediately? So in order to get someone engaged, you got to maybe ask them a question they haven't heard before or show them something that they haven't seen before. So this advice is not really like when you hear it, it's not like earth shattering advice, but there's some people who don't do this. So you get on a sales call, right? And in the beginning, I always do this if I meet with someone new. I say, hey, I, I've done some research on your company. Like, mind if I share that with you? Oh, yeah, sure. And then I'll share what I've learned via research right at the beginning of the call. Now, what that does is that now gets someone more engaged because I just broke their pattern. Typically, if they hop on a call with a sales rep, it's, hey, how's it going? Oh, cool. I see that you have uh, something in the background. That's that's dope. I like the quote. Yeah, okay. You talked for like four minutes. And then you're like, all right, cool. Well, here's the agenda today. So here's what I'm talking about. I'm asking some questions. Oh, yeah, cool. Ask the same questions you always ask. It's boring. You get to end the next steps. They say, yeah, let me go talk to someone on the team. And you get ghosted. That's like a typical sales call. So the thing at the end of the day is if you come in and say, hey, I actually have done some research. Let me talk to you about it. That's going to show that they're engaged because you as the rep came prepared and now that buyer is now more engaged. And so that's the way you can engage people in the beginning is telling and showing them something that they didn't know that you would come with. It's, it's a good call out when we were just talking to Garen Hess who runs uh, consensus. And he was saying, you know, most reps get on their first demo, right? Cause every call to action on every software or technology company now and everyone's technology company is see a demo. 
Yep. And it's the same monotony. It's the same talk about my product. Tell me how it works, all this stuff. But you haven't. I like what you just said. You, you, you validated like, hey, this is who your company is. This is what's in it for you. I know about you. I care about you. Now let's talk about what this product is rather yeah. than the reverse where it just comes in and it's like, oh, let me show you what this is all about. You're obviously interested in me. So I must be right. the important person, not the buyer being the important person. Exactly. And, and again, if you can do again, it's called um, time of value. So if you're listening, it's called time of value. Take note on this. So if you if you meet, if you really think about this, if you meet anyone in per, anyone at any time, it doesn't matter who it is outside of sales. Subconsciously, everyone has a time of value. Can this person show me any type of value and like why I should continue to talk with them? Mm hmm. That's like life. Like, if think about it. It's like if we yeah. go on a date. If you go on a date, it's time of value. Is this person valuable enough for me to talk to them on a second date? Like, if you're in a sales call, is this person valuable enough for me to want to talk to them again? So I have to waste another thirty minutes, right? So everything you're looking at is time of value. So when I give you that advice, that's what you're doing. You're you're immediately getting to the outcome of time of value, and that's what you want. And I and I like this because the idea of the the narrative and oh if you can't control the narrative but but this is the part yeah. where you can control like whether you have a compelling narrative whether you have the best research in the world to drop on them or not easiest way to create value is to just start talking about them you know yeah. it's just like dating like you might know this person from adam but if you show up at the table and all you do is talk about yourself and that person can't get the word in there was a funny video i think uh was it sherry levitt in post on linkedin she was like went on a date most of the entire date, the person just talked about themselves. Every time you try to put something in like, oh, yeah, I have a dog, too. Yeah. They just talked about themselves. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, okay. <laughs> I'm not getting any value out of this. I'm yeah. out. <laughs> it's, so, it's that, so, that's what, so that, yeah, that's the way you have to think about it. So, yes, if you look at the relationships that are the closest to you or even the relationships that are uh, those things, that's important. Um, there was a study that was done. Uh, Chris, I think Chris, I was watching a Chris Voss course, also Vanessa Van Edwards, who also does communication. And if you go to a party, you can try this out. I've, I've done this before. And it's very fascinating. Anyone listening, you can do this as well. If you just ask the person questions, but like, you know, thoughtfully, you're not like, hey, what's this? What's this? If you like in the question and you actually ask some questions and you never talk about yourself, they'll actually walk away being like, that was the best conversation of my entire night. Because they just talked about themselves the entire time. But yeah. in most conversations, like that's <laughs> it can come down to that. It's like you're you're showing actually time of value by asking really good questions that they probably are thinking about, but people don't ask them. And they're excited to share because it's stuff that was in their head all along. So if you can do that, that's important. Again, that's how you get someone engaged, is you show them something different than what people typically get. But only again, leading with the facts is also important as well. Yeah, and and then on that first call, because I see this in the virtual space, the, the first calls going to the second call, like that gap has become more and more difficult to, to really get past. Yeah, 100%. Everybody comes in, kick the tires. Okay, sounded interesting. But what an interesting way. You might have some sales leaders going, oh gosh, now I'm going to have my first demo calls, not talk about my product. Or some CEOs say, gosh, I got to have my product put in there. But you do. But to just talk about the prospect and just have a good conversation where they leave that first meeting positive and engaged, probably more effective at winning that second call than giving them the lowdown on your solution. Well, let's talk about that. So right now, as I'm, I'm, I'm building my company, I was just meeting with um, my operations coach this morning, and we were talking about how every single piece of your process needs to correlate to the buying experience. So how does someone feel after each call and are you guiding them on that experience? Most sellers are just order takers. They're not legitimately sales professionals or guiding them in an experience. And that's not calling it out. That's actually just, that's just legitimate facts, right? It's yeah. just, it just what it is, what it is. 20% of the sales starts bring in 80% of the revenue. So objectively, what I'm saying is it's true, right? Whether you feel, whether you feel that or not, it's just true. So the next step in that is saying, okay, I'm a sales rep. I need to make sure that I give people a really good, buying experience right so whether however you feel about this company or not it doesn't really matter but you probably have been there before disney disney world mm -hmm. right or disneyland if you're on the west coast but the thing is is that like when you go to the to the park you're not confused like they 
they do it pretty well. They're like, here's your bracelet. Here's what the bracelet does. Here's how you get on the rides. Here's a map. Here's where you need to go. And, and every time you go to experience or you go watch, uh, if you go to a ride or if you even go to a show, they tell you exactly what the show is going to be about. And they tell you exactly what the ride's about. Imagine if you went to Disney World and they gave you no map. There was no people working in the park and they were just like, best of luck. That's how most sellers run calls. They're like, yeah. hey, here's this big park. I'm going to show you all. The, here are all the rides uh, and just tell me what you think. That's why most people run sales calls. So I'm just, yeah. I want you to just imagine this. You go to Disney World, literally get dropped off, and they don't tell you what to do. You would be like, what? What is going on here? But that again, that's what's happening to buyers. They're confused. They don't understand what's going on. And so, yeah, they're not going to buy anything from you because they're confused. They have other things to do. So you have to think about what is the buyer experience uh, from beginning to end. I'll give an example. So at the end of that first call, like we're talking about, going into the second call, you need to be making sure that you're telling people what is the next step. Hey, we're seven minutes at the end of this call. Typically, the next step is we get a follow-up call. Here are the things we talk about in the follow-up call. And like, do you feel comfortable moving forward with that next step, right? My my, This is probably just what I've grown into. I'm very direct at the end of the first call. If someone is like, yeah, I'll get back to you, 98% of the time, they will not. I call people out on now. I'm like, hey, typically people say that they're just not interested and I said something wrong. What happened? And people are like, oh, well, and then they and then they tell me what happened. And then, okay, cool, I'm, not a fit. I'm fine with that. I just, I don't want to spend time writing a phone book email and you don't have time, you're not going to be able to read it. Yeah. I can spend that 20 to 30 minutes going find someone else. And again, that may sound cutthroat and savage, but that's just the facts. Like, I don't have any time to follow up with someone consistently if they just weren't interested. And if I messed up, I like to get the feedback to figure out where I can improve. I'm all about that. I'm not mad at the person, like, emotionally. I'm just saying, logically, I'm trying to save myself time. So that buyer experience of, are we moving to the second call or not? It needs to be there. Most people that say, hey, I'm going to let you know, they will not let you know. You will fall up with them relentlessly, and they will forget about you. That's just the way it is. Well, and, and I think it's fascinating because that is so counterintuitive to the way we market and sell in most environments, right? Yeah. We set up a big number. We go, okay, who are all the companies that we could possibly sell to? LinkedIn tells us, all the data tells us, only 5% <laughs> yep. of those companies are in market. Yep. Right? At any given time. But what do we do? We spend our money, our time, our research, all of our, all of our resources, not research, resources, yep. going after all these companies, keeping them in opportunities that go too long, forecasts are missed, all the pipeline numbers get skewed, everything else. When in reality, we could have just focused on, okay, great. Are you in market, out of market? Oh, you're out of market. Awesome. Throw you into a brand campaign. Get to know Unifor. Get to know your brand. Get to know whatever the company is. Yep. Let them come back to you when they come back to you, right? But don't go hard sell them for the next six months or waste your time as a seller trying to convince them when they're just not even there or interested. Yeah. It's... It, and I, and I think right now with, with budgets and with the economics, I'm seeing more brands reduce spend, more demand gen, or this has to equate to stage zeros or opportunities. Every dollar we spend has to equate. And I get that. We have to be efficient with our dollars. But it seems like a really short-sighted way to go to market. Yes. I, I, how do we get ourselves out of this insanity loop a little bit? Of just wasting dollars, <laughs> well, not of wasting dollars but of, of trying to of trying to convince and push people that have no interest or brands that are nowhere companies that are nowhere ready to adopt a technology or to adopt a solution or buy. Yeah, to move them to buy hard because of the mechanisms of of most businesses, right? If I mean, if you're getting if you're taking not to go too much rabbit hole, obviously if you're taking funding, you need to move quick, right? So those those yeah. are there's some there's some driving behaviors there, but again, that's a different conversation. Uh, let's think about it differently though. If you are pushing out content, if you're pushing out, you know, all these marketing dollars, not everyone is ready to buy. I don't know what the stat is. I think it's like it's some crazy stat. It's like expert. It's like maybe 20% of people are like actually ready to buy that you're marketing to. I don't know. It's some, some stat I saw. I've heard that. 5%. That's what LinkedIn said. 5%. Oh, okay. Okay. Five. Yeah. Even lower Which is than even what smaller. I thought. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, I try to be nice. Uh, so basically the content that you're putting out there it doesn't mean that they're going to buy today, but they might buy tomorrow. So really your content is more of a nurture and you have to think of it that way. You may not get that direct ROI immediately. 
And that's that probably is probably one of the biggest misses, right? Is that you think you're going to get that immediately. You might not. And you have to be okay with that. So I don't think it's like spending less. I think it's just spending in the right places with what you're doing right now. But your expectations and your outcomes have to change. That like, it's not going to be an overnight. You put this content here and everybody's going to want to talk to you. No, you have to expect that it might be different. Do you think that the content long game with the amount of noise in the market has gotten even longer? Or do you think that with the right content, you can break through the noise pretty quickly? Hmm. So with the right content, you can break through the noise quickly, but I want to give you all the three T's. This is just how I think about content. And if you look at companies that are successful, they follow these three T's. So one, timing. So if your product has the right timing and the right messaging with where the market's at, your content will be on point and people will gravitate towards it, right? If someone was talking about AI five years ago, people probably wouldn't pay attention as much as they are today. Yeah. Right? Even though it'd be cool, it just wouldn't be as relevant, right? So there's that. Mm-hmm. The, the second is the topic. So what is your topic that you're talking about? How are you going about that? Mm-hmm. That's important. And then the third piece is the talent. So you could have really good content, but if you don't have talent to put it through, people might not see it. If you think about the successful brands in the SaaS space, there has been talent around the topic and the timing was appropriate. Even if you think about, uh, we were talking about this before the call, but if you think about sports, is it not the same thing? The only difference is you take out the topic, but it really is just timing and talent, right? Yep. And you can even say the theme. I would, I would switch out topic for theme. So I'll give you a good example. If you have watched The Last Dance before, you're very familiar with a team called the Bad Boy Pistons, right? Yep. And so <laughs> they won two back-to-back championships. No one really talks about because no one liked them. But the thing is, they had the three T's, though. Timing yeah. was appropriate because if they played in today's NBA, they would not have won, I don't think. Like they no. would, all their players would be ejected like <laughs> in the first <laughs> game, right? Like they yeah. just wouldn't be able to play the same type of basketball. That would yep. that irritated the points, right? They, they, so timing was really good for them. It was right in that era where like this was this was the thing, right? They had the talent, right? They got they had Rahman, they had Isaiah Thomas, they had Mahorn, right? They had Lambeer, right? They had they had the squad, right? And so they could actually go up against these teams and score. And then also the the the, the um the theming around it too is that like they created this aura and this energy around their team that people gallivanted around and people wanted to join that team as free agents. And that's why they continuously got better. Right. And then eventually, you know, beat, beat the Lakers and, you know, beat something to the whole thing. So if you look at sports, it's pretty consistent like that. Like even with Steph Curry, like he complete, like timing was right. If yeah. Steph Curry was playing in the nineties, he would have, they would have just clotheslined him and shoot threes. They're just like, dude, we're just going to, we're just going to beat you up. You're not going to be like, able to play in this game. Yeah. 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 You're going to cross the court. And we're just going to trip you. Like they just wouldn't have worked. Right. But he was playing in a game where like they weren't doing that. And then obviously he had talent around it. And then the theming around it was everyone wanted to shoot three. So it worked. So th- that's the way you have to think about the content is that, is it, is it right uh, during that time? And so if you're creating next level content but then the audience isn't ready that could be problematic as well so my answer to the question is that if you're just doing it the normal way yeah the content's going to take longer but if you're thinking about it be uh, thoughtfully like mm-hmm. um this is like a new term i'm, I'm playing around with it, so i'm just gonna throw it out there innovative broadcasting like if okay. you're really thinking about it in that way like you're going to be more successful well I, I look back to the the case study of like drift for example to right. me that was like perfect time right Inbound was starting to slow down a little bit, but it had been widely adopted. All of a sudden, people hate doing forms. So every marketer is looking at how do I get away from forms? And Dave and and Dave and Dave, David Cancel and and Dave Gerhardt were like the perfect vehicle. Perfect time. To push that. Yeah. That it's no, it's it's spot on. It's a good case study in terms of like those those three things. And I think they use the right vehicles to do it. Like the the right content mediums and, and those pieces. Yeah. As, as just one that I think stands out to me. And I'm sure there's a, a thousand others out there. But it's so many. But yeah, but yeah, but Drift is an example, three T's. So that's how you have to think about it. I, I love it. Um, so take me back a little bit. You've been a seller at heart for a number of years. Talk me through kind of that, that, that you've, you've moved into the content realm and the creator realm, but 
talk to me about kind of what got you into selling and, and that backstory. I think I'm the same story as every other seller. We never wanted to get into it. Uh, and then we, and then we stayed. So I, yeah, so I started off as a public speaker out of college. I went to high schools and colleges and did a ton of talks. The reason that's relevant is because I went to the national speakers association for a meeting and met someone there that told me I needed to get into sales. So that's how I got into sales. Cause he was like, you should probably do this. And I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Uh, it was great. I mean, I learned a lot. I mean, still is, but learned a lot in the journey of sales. Sales is the cornerstone of anything you do uh, as a, as a business owner. It obviously helps me cause I can sell. So I can always go out and get that revenue that's needed and to grow the business. Right. So it's, it's an accelerator to all those degrees and also life is sales too. And you start realizing the similarities of everything you do is sales. Right. And so that's incredibly important. I think also as well, in my journey of sales, I've just learned a lot of uh, being direct, but not rude, uh, being concise, being thorough, uh, clarifying literally everything mm -hmm. with questions. I've become a healthy skeptic. I'm not, I'm not jaded, but I'm a healthy skeptic. I, I, I do trust things, but I don't trust them a lot. So I ask a lot of questions until it's clarified that, okay, this can be trustworthy, which is good in a lot of scenarios. Yeah. I think it's it's a natural tendency we all have, especially in today's world, and one we should probably strengthen is like uh, Ethan Butte. I had him on the the podcast a while back, and yeah, he said we all have this hardwired BS meter, right? Like yeah, yeah, exactly. We all have that, and we're programmed to have that. And exactly. I think that's where in sales, maybe sales gets that bad persona sometimes because we brush up against that BS meter a lot with our outbound or with our. Yeah trying to convince people or trying to sell people on something. Exactly. It, it, it's, it, you're running up against it. And that's why you have to be very thoughtful in the way you ask questions. Uh, one of my favorite books is question based selling. It's literally how you, how you ask these questions to uncover these certain things. And if you're able to ask great questions, you're going to get great answers. And that's how I think about it. Now you've been a Forex LinkedIn sales voice. You, you obviously in your sales career, you got a lot of visibility and built a lot of relationships mm. and had a lot of traction through, through what you were sharing in your content. What are some takeaways as you look back? Like what were the, the building blocks that got you there? I know there's a lot of sellers that go, man, I, LinkedIn for me is just not something I'm in or it's not, but you can gain a lot of value. Yeah. So this is, this is the easiest, this is the most simple way to think about why you should build a brand and you can there's a lot of other benefits but this is the core reason i didn't realize this until about a year and a half in mm -hmm. but it's the it's really the only thing that i truly think about outside of like obviously imbalance and impact of business but it's mm -hmm. access so Leah, because i have a brand because people see my videos i have access to people that other other people might not yeah. So I can I can go on I can go on a Twitter and I'm doing it right now going Twitter Instagram I can I can message someone, right? And when you message someone, what are they what are they going to do first? Who the heck is this person? So they're going to check out your content. They're going to probably Google you and be like, "Yo, what is this person about?" And they Google you and they're like, "Wait, this person has been producing content for years." That shows a lot. What does that mean? That shows consistency. Like this person yeah. shows up every single day, so that's ingrained in them. If they can actually watch my videos and be like, I can relate to this person. Do I like them or not? Do they have the right energy? Like you can tell by watching the videos, right? Yep. You're going to see like how, how long it's taken to build something. So like, okay, cool. Like, you know, they know how to build. That's important. And so that's why content is critical because it allows for you to scale out your reputation past what you're doing with people internally or client facing or whatever they may be. So that's how I see brand is it just is building your reputation digitally at scale and it gives you access to people that other people cannot get access to because people are seeing that content. And as a seller, it's not creating a content piece every single day. It's just once a week, can I share a piece of information that people are going to find relevant? Only like one to 3% of people post consistently, right? So if you can be uh, one of the one to 3% and post weekly, you still are ahead of 90, you know, 7% yeah. of people. And that's the way that I think about it. I love how you talk about access because the biggest challenge, we did a, a study of over 500 buyers and sellers. Every seller out there, their number one problem was getting access. Hardest thing for them to do. 
And, and you kind of yeah. think back and you think, okay, but we have put more technology. We have put more tools, more cadences, more this, more that, more channels in front of people to get attention than ever before. But it's yeah. still getting access is so tough. So I think a good takeaway for everybody on this call is that that personal brand piece, because as a marketer, I look at it and I think it's the same thing for companies. Hey, why is it so hard to fill an event? Why is it so hard to mm. get a webinar to, to get a large population? Whatever it might be. How do we get those numbers up? It comes back to brand. And I think brand to me equals trust. Exactly. And, and yeah. that's what you've hit on. Yeah. It, it's a really good call out there. So what are you excited about for the future? What's going to change? What's going to be different in the next few years? Babe Ruth, mm -hmm. call your shot. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. I'm only saying this because I said it on our webinar yesterday and none of the panelists agreed with me. <laughs> and you know what? I love, I love it when that happens. Yeah. I love it when no one agrees with me because when that happens, I'm like, all right, that means I'm probably onto something because no one agrees with me here. So and I just like, I just like going on a panel and someone actually disagrees because you always hear like, I agree. It's like, oh, I agree with your point. Like, I wanted people to be like, I disagree. I'm like, great. So I have two things. One is, oh, alas, so you probably don't want to hear this, but I have to tell you what's happening because people won't tell you this. There are going to be less salespeople in the next 10 years. Period. If you think there's going to be more, I, I have an a answer for you, and it, that's just not going to happen. Objectively, if you look at history, data, how, how revolutions work when new technology comes into play, it replaces people, but not re completely replacing people. It replaces certain jobs to create new ones, by the way. So yep. certain jobs will be uh, replaced. So like I think a majority, not well, I think a good, a good amount, not a majority, good amount of SDRs will be replaced. I think a solid amount of AEs will be. A lot of people are going to go full sales cycle because they're going to realize that motion works and AI prompters will be created. I mean, I'm seeing, I mean, you all, you all know from your own product, yeah. I'm seeing with what working with clients, what AI can do. And we're not even, we're not even there. AI is like a little, like two week old baby right now. Like yeah. that's yeah, all these people understand. Cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's like, it's like, it's like barely done anything yet. So again, when, when I think about the future, I'm not thinking about what's going to happen in six months to a year. That That's cool, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm saying in the next 10 years, you got to think in decades. In the next 10 years, yeah, to say that there's going to be the same amount of sales reps in STRs logically doesn't make any sense when I already see what the infancy of what AI can do. And I'm just playing around with prompts and getting deep in it. And I know people are better prompt engineers than I am. And I, and I, and I work with a couple. So the thing is, is that a lot of the things that are happening today, AI will be able to do for the manual task and expedite skilled reps to do more. Right now, the active selling time is 27%. So AI could probably 3x that. So now you're getting in the 70% active selling time range. Do you think that a seller who has 70% active selling time, do you think they're going to need the other reps? No. 20% of the rep, 20% of the reps are bringing 80% of the revenue. If your CFO is looking at that, they're going to be like, okay, cool. If we can bring AI to like increase my team's efficiencies and manual tasks, and enhance my top reps in their skill set. What would what would the other reps be doing there? Like, just just logically think about it. So, I'm taking my emotions out of it. So, mm -hmm. when you logically think about it, the future of where we're going is, I would understand how AI works first and foremost. If you don't, you need to. Also, yeah. as well, you need to understand how the AI prompters are going to be playing into it, right? So, you want to understand in that. Uh, this is a huge time to be building relationships. The reason why I go to a conference like every other month, or not if not every month. Because building relationships is going to be important because, yeah, AI is going to ruin that a little bit. But if you have good connections, like you're going to be ahead of the game. Right. And then totally. if, you're, if you're thinking about being a content creator and you're selling a technology where the buyers and the platform are active, you should be doing that regardless and in, in taking that route because people are going to know who you are and you're going to have that credibility. So I think we're going to see not more content creators, but more subject matter experts in their topics so they can get a good sales pipeline flow we're going to see more people creating shows for themselves or we're going to see ai take over a lot of functions of the manual process which again will allow for less sales reps but more efficiency and i truly do believe at the end of the day that we're gonna have a lot more full sales cycle reps crazy that i'm saying this because like you know i've been sdr advocate since day one so I, that's who i've always been but i also have to look at the reality of the situation 
I hate to say I'm going to agree with you on this one because I really wanted to disagree. <laughs> I, I, I really truly I, look, wanted I, to I'm, disagree. I, everyone who disagrees, they're like, they get in their feelings about it, though. I, you can't I get in your feelings with this. Like, yeah. Here, here's my piece. I was just on the last few episodes, we were talking about sales engineering, right? And I said, that is the AE of tomorrow. Yeah. Because to me, you've got so much of this buyer journey that's getting taken up by marketing or whatever you want to say, self-guided, right? On demand learning, education, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Get out there. Then you've got a seller. And every conversation that I see the seller at that starts at like back where just marketing content, we could have easily just said, hey, this is what the product does or this is what we're solving. Those demos are going to go away. They're going to get automated, right? The AE that's just the order taker, that's just the relationship guy, mm. probably going away too. Right. But the person who's like that system integrator, that person that's like truly that trusted advisor that comes in and knows like, how all the tools work together, can paint the picture, can show you the plumbing. Mm -hmm. That's the person that's going to build enough confidence in the buying group to actually sell the deal. Exactly. And I, and I think that full cycle gives you the opportunity as a seller rather than handing something off and like, hey, I, Mr. SDR, made a, made a great contact with Morgan, but now I got to hand him off. And then he's going to meet two other people that Morgan's going to introduce him to, but I don't know him. Like being full cycle and being able to get to take that whole journey with that buying group, I think is actually going to build more trust in the buying group. It's like, well, oh, here's my here's my Yoda to take me on this buying journey. Exactly, and because you think of the buyer, right? They, it's already, it's already happening. So think about it this yeah. way, right? Like, it's not truly AI, but you can think of it this way. Like Amazon, for example, like most people don't go to the mall or the store as much anymore. If they want to, or a bookstore, if they want to buy a book, they go to Amazon, right? Yep. Amazon, if you buy a book, immediately it tells you other books that are recommendations. It gives you reviews right there. I mean, all, all that stuff is happening. So could not, could they not be same in the B2B process? I think in some areas, yes, in some areas like no, right? Obviously if it's a 12 month, 18 month sales cycle, completely different scenario, but I'm saying that you just have to be mindful of how the technology is going to play into those certain factors. Well, an, an enterprise buyer remorse of a million dollar deal compared to my buyer remorse of damn, that Amazon book's going to sit on the shelf and I'm not going to read it way different. Right. And I think that yeah. the one stat that worried me about the on demand, which is where I'll never agree with someone who says sales is going away is the buyer remorse in a self-guided sales process where you just go online and buy and for B2B, is really high. Yeah. It's really high. I think it's like like above 50%. I'm not gonna throw the stat out there, but it was it was to the point where I'm like, whoa, most of these purchases where there is no seller involved ends in buyer remorse and they're like, ah, did I really get the right stuff? Yeah. And that's gonna be detrimental to everybody long term when you look at a recurring revenue model. Exactly. And then people will again will be more hesitant to buy eight. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna make it even tougher. Well, it's, it's fascinating. I love going deep in that with you because it, it all circles back to me of, of the core foundation of why humans are in this, why people still buy from people, mm -hmm. which is the trusted advisor, the emotional connections, the fact that any of us listening, I think, haven't made a purchase of something we, you know, from someone we don't like or a company we don't trust most of the time. Right. Right. It's just how we, how we buy. So yeah. Fun to learn from you, Morgan, a little bit of time learning about you. I know you talked about a little bit of your background, but you were located in Atlanta, Georgia? That is correct. Perfect. And you were um, going back, SDR, big advocate for the SDR function. Talk about some of your past roles and then a little bit about present day, what you're doing and all that's going on at Ascension. Yeah, so <laughs> SDR role is hard, man. <laughs> that, role, that, role, that role sucked in the beginning. Uh, but the thing is, I was doing a training session like two years after that role and I started doing sales training with John and someone asked me what kept me going as an SDR. And in some of these training sessions, you just get very thoughtful questions and you just like reflect on life. You're like, that's a good question. And I said, well, I know that if I can get through the mental strain of being an SDR, there isn't much in life that I can't get through. Because if you think about it, it's a very like, 
sickening role, like mentally. So think about this, Yeah. right? You wake up in the morning and you're going to work knowing you're going to get rejected by 98% of people you run into that day. And maybe one or two people say yes. And you do that every day for a year to a year and a half. That's a pretty sickening mindset. <laughs> like I'm literally going to work. I'm going to be rejected. Most people, they go to work and like maybe they have one fire they got to put out. But no, you're going to work at like every person you talk to does not want to talk to you and like doesn't want to, doesn't hate you. Not hate you, but they don't like you. So they don't like you. Yeah. That's a door to door salesman in today's day and age. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't yeah. Hang so on my door. It's hard. So yeah. uh, I learned a lot through that and it's helped me build, understand how to build pipeline skill wise. It's helped me to be able to sell. And that's where I started. And then when I started creating content, that's when things started evolving because then I became a manager. And had 13 reps, which I don't recommend going over eight or nine, by the way. I don't know why I decided to do 13. Uh, uh -huh. But it, it went well. Like, the team did extremely well. But it that was a lot going on. But I enjoyed it. And then through that manager role, that's when I got recruited to be a sales trainer and, you know, train the top tech companies in the world on sales training. And that was a massive learning lesson because I got to learn a lot about myself, like traveling, seeing the world. Uh, training different companies in different places in the world. So I understand understood the culture of those places, which is huge. It's different selling culture everywhere. Like I'm, I'm blown away by all the things that I learned in different cultures where I was like, what the heck? Like I never would have known that. And <laughs> it's really just taking in those lessons and then being like, what do you do next with it? And how does it apply to what you do today? So those are the rules that I was in. Uh, it's been always sit around sales. I made a shift towards non-sales now, but those years that I was doing that was great. And and I want to tap on something, the mental sharpness you talked about. How, you know, because people say EQ and the buzzwords, but I always break it down from it. It's like it's self-awareness, it's motivation. Those are the two yep. pieces that come to my mind when you think of like mental acuity, mental sharpness in that SDR function, especially. Right. Yeah. And there's way too many people burnt out. Like what are some tactics for audience for people that are feeling that right now? How do you build that sharpness? Uh, so you need to write down your energy gauge or like your energy assessment. So a lot of people will be like, Hey, audit your time and you should do that. But you also need to figure out where your energy is going. So you need to write down what gets you excited. Yeah. What doesn't get you excited. Right. What's mediocre. And I did this exercise as well. So I found, okay, these things get me excited. These things don't get me excited. So you need to figure out for the things that don't get excited, but you need to do them, when will you do them? And then when you get excited about something, what time should you be doing those? So really it comes down to like time management to figure out when do you get your energy and when you don't, but also it's a, an assessment mentally of why do you feel burnt out? And a lot of this is just writing it out or just talking to yourself being like, okay, I feel burnt out. How do I actually feel? And writing out how you legitimately feel. Is it angry? Is it anxiety? anxiety sorry. Then once you identify the feelings, you have to figure out how do I make myself feel better? Maybe it's, okay, I need to go take a walk every day. I need to go read. I need to go call somebody, et cetera. You have to figure out how you feel about something and then figure out the solution to how you feel about it. I, I love that. You're making me think of Daniel Pink. Um, I saw him at a Gartner conference and he wrote the book, When. And if you yeah. haven't read it, it's it's an awesome one, but it talks about those wavelengths of each of us. And like, we all have our, our peaks and valleys during the day. And his whole thing is like, look, w when you have this peak, like when you're super creative, for most people, it's in the afternoon, do the creative things. When you're yep. super focused and calm and can kind of get the task work done in the morning or something, do those things or whatever right. it might be, the deep thought understanding how each of us interacts and what influences that is so critical. It's critical to know yourself because some people yeah. like myself, like I work very early in the morning because that's where I focus best, but some people work very well in the afternoon. I do not. So you have to know what those zones of focus are and energy. And that's another thing you have to assess, which I agree with. Yeah. Interesting stuff. And, and I think that leads into a little bit on the coaching side. We don't have enough time to dig into it on this one, but just that idea of when you do coaching, how you give enough time for coaching. And, and for, for our listeners, we were talking before this episode, it's like coaching is like the professional athlete kind of paradigm, right? Where you, you practice and train for game day 90% yeah. of the time and only play on the field 10%. But right. somehow in sales, we've, we've flipped that. that Best of luck. <laughs> yeah, you need to, you need to, I mean, depending on what you're doing, like weekly is obviously recommended, but 
bi-weekly at least, right? Like, what are you doing to get better? I mean, we get, we have all these different tools out here that can track all the things that you're doing and, and why not use those inputs that you're getting to figure out what your output should be. So I always tell people like really focus in and lock in on bi-weekly trainings for yourself. But if you can get your leadership in bi-weekly trainings as well too, and that's the key. Because if you're not doing that, then yeah, you're in, you're in massive trouble. So that the things that I absolutely focus on and lock into is how do we look at what we're doing? Yep. Where are my deficiencies and how do I get better? If I'm realizing I'm not getting to power, I need to spend my bi sessions on getting to power. If I'm realizing I'm not good at negotiation, I keep losing on discounting, I need to get better at discounting. And that's how you can get better at these areas. You have to hyper-focus on one area to get better. I'll leave, speaking of sports, I'll leave with this last story. Um, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. But one thing he talked about is when he was bad at, when he used to be bad at basketball. And the way he got better at basketball is he would dedicate a month to each skill set. So he'd be like, okay, for this month, I'm only going to focus on threes. Next month, I'm only going to focus on free throws. Next month, I'm only going to focus on mid-range. So as a rep, you should be doing the same thing. you got to hyper-focus on an area that's going to give you the highest lift. So I'm going to hyper-focus on um, objection handling. I'm going to hyper-focus on a negotiation. I'm going to hyper-focus on discovery. And even as a leader, you should be looking at the same things too on what you should be coaching and focusing on. Uh, and, I, and I do the same thing myself. I look at what is happening in my world as in the, within my business and figure out, okay, I need to hyper-focus on this right now because it will give me that extra lift rather than everything else I should be working on. I love that. And I also love the fact that it's a month, right? Like he didn't just say, Oh, I'm going to focus on it for a day. Like, yeah. no, this is an extended period of time. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, Kobe, a month free throws. There's probably like 3000 or 30,000 free throws that he shot during that time. Period. Right. And I think exactly. the repetition is so critical. Exactly. We don't give them that. No, do it once or twice, have a conversation, do a role play. Yeah, it's not applicable. It's not applicable and it's not helpful for anyone. And you don't want that. Well, Morgan, I know we're going to continue this conversation. We've got the webinar coming up on July 18th, but also I'm going to have to have you back on B2B EQ because there's so much more we could cover. But for the sake of this episode, where can people connect with you? Where can they find your content? What's the best way to, to get in touch with you? Uh, LinkedIn, Morgan J. Ingram. If you want to go on YouTube, I'm starting to put more videos out there. So it's just Morgan J. Ingram at Morgan J. Ingram. And then if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, uh, it's MorganJIngram.com commish. So that's the best place to find me. Awesome. Morgan, such a fun time having you on. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a great episode. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Awesome. Well, hey, to all of our listeners out there, we'll see you next time on B2B EQ. In the meantime, find us on YouTube, catch us anywhere you can listen to a podcast, go find Morgan, make sure you follow him, listen, get to his content. It's great wisdom out there and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.